Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Christine Dixon of The Ordinary Sacred, and I'm so happy that you're here with me. I know we are here asynchronistically, but I am grateful for you. I'm grateful for your attention, uh, just for you being interested in these exciting topics of inner healing. Um, and I want to point out the beautiful flowers that my husband uh, planted and picked for me. Uh, you can see the daffodil and some geraniums there. So I'm going to continue with some more tips that Martha Sweezy gives in internal family systems therapy for shame and guilt. And we'll do two or three more today. And these are tips on witnessing and unburdening which is often what we do with exiles, um, but also with, with protectors. So the first tip that Martha Sweezy gives, this is on page 259, is trying versus doing. She says, if a client says a protector is trying to relax or an exile is trying to let go of a burden, the part in question is not yet ready to relax or unburden. Either it's ready to do that or it's not. The protector who relaxes will get a better connection with the client's self. The exile who unburdens will annul its attachment to imposed ideas about who it is. But the part has to be ready. Unburdening is letting go not trying to let go. So, and, I, and a note that I would add to that is that if you notice that language, you know, it's trying or it wants to, um, you know, sometimes there will feel like an efforting because it feels like it should do this, but it still doesn't want to. It's not a natural flow of letting go or unburdening. It just means that there is something blocking the way. It just means there's a, a fear, a concern that hasn't been met yet, because once all of those concerns are met, the part will be able to relax back of its own will effortlessly, or will be able to release the burden and say, yes, of course, I want to release this, this belief about myself or this um, heavy emotion or whatever it is, <clears throat> or this job, right? If it's a protector. So if there's any resistance at all, don't push past it. Take it seriously and it's okay. It's just letting you know that there's um, something else that needs to be addressed. So you can ask it, it, just really say, you don't have to do this, you know, until you're ready. It's okay. You're not bad or anything like that. There's no pressure. Just let me know maybe what's holding you back. I'll just give an example. I had a part uh, releasing this guilt over my first husband's death, thinking that I was a bad girl for leaving my marriage. And it, it kept, you know, there were a lot of other parts around it that desperately wanted it to give up its burden. Please, please, please just give this up because it's so heavy in our system. Um, but the part just wasn't ready and I asked why, and the first um, concern was that it would mean a breaking relationship with my mother, who was such a huge source of re the religious um, indoctrination that this part had about what it means to be a good girl, that if I release this burden, I'll break connection with her. So I was able to meet that concern by calling in the self of my mother and asking her, is it okay to release this? And of course, her self said yes. Um, and then the rest of the system was like, yay, she's going to release the burden now. But no, she still was so, had so much trepidation about releasing this burden of being a bad girl. So it's okay. You know, what's, what's the concern now? And her concern was about hell, that she would go to hell if she wasn't sufficiently convinced that she was bad, right? <clears throat> Which would then 
make her good and worthy of going to heaven. And so I actually brought in other parts who had unburdened their belief on hell, but she hadn't yet. And they came in and they told her how free they were now and and the, the good fruit of that, of releasing that belief. And she was convinced by them and their experience. And, um, and then she was very freely ready to release her burden. There was no resistance. Uh, she just, she showed me exactly where the burdens were. She was told me how she wanted to release them. Um, so once all the concerns are met in the system, it will flow very naturally. If it doesn't flow naturally, it's okay. You're not doing anything wrong. It just means there are reasons. There are things that need to be addressed. Okay. Um, the next tip that Martha gives is one line and it's entitled exiled needs. And she says, exiled parts need to feel sanctioned, legitimate, and loved. And that's one sentence. Um, and I'll just say, yes, I agree. I often say that all any part ever wants is to be seen and heard and accepted and valued and loved just as they are. This is true for both protectors and exiles who are often all quite young. Um, but especially for exiles, because they have this history of being rejected, pushed aside um, by other well-meaning parts that have learned that that aspect of us or that part that holds a, a certain trait like sensitivity or excitement or anger, pushback, self-agency, whatever it is, they had to push it away and make it not legitimate, call it evil, shame it, um, in order for our whole system to be lovable and accepted um, in our outer world. So they did it for a reason, but because those parts have been treated as illegitimate or bad for so long, they really benefit, not just from the self telling them, like giving lip service, no, you are good. Uh, sometimes that can be another part. In my experience, what the self does is the self just knows <laughs> the innate worth of these parts and just delights in them and feels tender and loving toward them. And so I often say the self's loving gaze on the parts is what convinces them of their innate worth, of their legitimacy, um, that they are sanctioned and they are loved. Okay. And so I'll do one more tip. The third tip here uh, from Martha is, how do I know if a protector or an exile is telling this story? So I guess this is a, a tip on how to, how to find out. If a story is being told inside, how do you know if it's a protector or an exile? So she says, if a client tells a sad or horrifying story, as if they are repeating a shopping list. I know that a manager who separates facts from feelings is hard at work. And at the moment, the client has no compassion to offer the exile. If a client tells a traumatic story and then stops to criticize or contradict themselves, I guess that a protector is interrupting because the exile did not have permission to speak. Yeah, this is great. If the client tells a story that seems to have a lot of spin, for example, the other person is the only active character in the story. It's very outward focused. They did this, they did that. I will guess that it is a firefighter warding off a shaming manager inside as well as potential shaming from the outside. So that's usually the role of kind of these aggressive raging shaming, project the blame outward, firefighter parts. They're doing it in response to an inner shamer that's pointing at parts on the inside that feels so unbearable that they've got to push it out. Um, or they're getting a lot of shame from the outside, from other people, and they're trying to counteract it and say, no, 
that's not true. <laughs> I'm not at fault. You're at fault or they're at fault, right? So that's a, a really good guess that Martha has there. And then she says, but if the client's story is rich in detail, like a good novel, and I feel moved by it, I will assume that the speaker is an exile. Yeah, there's like usually a lot of emotion underneath what they're saying. Like they're in it, they feel the pain. She says, if I'm wrong, I will soon find out. <laughs> you learn to spot all this, she says. I love that. Yeah, it really is through experience of just listening that you begin to know, you know, when a person is blended with an exile, they'll say things like, I'm just so sad, or I'm so overwhelmed, or um, I'm so alone, right? And they'll say I, and but you can know by the way that they're speaking, um, just, just the deeply feeling pained parts are often exiles. It doesn't mean they... They necessarily are, but you can make a guess because of course, protected parts can also feel overwhelmed. They can feel all the emotions. Um, I like how she describes when, when they're telling the story in vivid detail, because a lot of the exiles are still stuck back in that moment and they do really see it. And you may have experienced if you're a practitioner or if you're a client, you may have experienced telling a story where you are really detached. <laughs> it's a narrator part or it's a manager part that's just going over and then this terrible thing happened and then that terrible thing happened and then I did this and then I did that. And so that's usually a manager that's telling the story. <clears throat> Sometimes you can notice parts that are trying to figure things out. And then I thought this, and I think maybe it could be from that but then that doesn't make sense. Maybe it could be this, right? And you can kind of see the person's figure it out, thinking, analyzing part at work. Um, when you hear a part say something like, um, I am so pathetic, right? Sometimes I'll, I'll get curious. I'll say, who's calling who pathetic? in the system is, is there a part? Cause usually there's two parts. There's one that's feeling pathetic and there's another one. Well, I don't know if they feel pathetic, but another one's calling them pathetic. And the, probably the pathetic one is feeling something really intensely, right? Is feeling something that the critic thinks is pathetic, thinks is weak or too much. Um, it might be, you know, something emotional, a sensitivity, pain. And so, um, you know, when, when, when a client comes in and they say things like, I hate myself, I'll say, Oh, so what part of you hates what other part of you? Right. Um, or they'll say, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll talk about a part and they'll say, this part hates me. And I'll say, can you ask that part who you are? Right, because usually when they hate something that they think is the person, they're pointing at another part. They mean, I hate that part over there that is forcing you to go, go, go and never rest. Or, you know, it's like, oh, what do they hate? What part are they pointing at? Right, we can get really curious and then we can ask that critic, can we go and help that part? Right, so it it is really uh one of the jobs of a of a IFS practitioner is to be a parts detector and just be curious and i love what martha said at the end of if i'm wrong they'll tell me they'll show me right so last thing i'll say about this is when i did a uh, training to be a wayfinder life coach with martha beck one of the first things she taught us was um you have a hunch, right? You say, oh, it seems like this to me. So you, you would say to the client, I have a hunch that you're afraid of your mother-in-law finding out your insecurity. I don't know, some hunch that you have. And then you would say, tell me where I'm wrong. 
and the person will correct you and you want to be corrected. You're offering this hypothesis in order for them to uh, say, oh, yes, that's that's right. Or no, 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 that's not right. It's this. But either way, you're getting more clarity in the system and the parts will correct you if you're wrong. So it's totally okay as a practitioner to have a hypothesis and be in the parts to tell you, no, 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 it's not. No, it's not quite that. It's this. And I love Martha's analogy. She said, it's like the branch that a bird pushes off to fly, right? It needs this resistance. It needs something to push off of in order to fly. So when we're saying, is it this? Then the, the, the part can say, ah, yes, and there's clarity or, oh, no, it's not that. But it gives them something to respond to, right? So the best we can do as a practitioner is follow our curiosity, presents our hunches, our hypothesis, and always be willing to be proved wrong because the client is always the expert in their own system and their parts will tell them. Even if we've had a hundred clients before that, you know, this was the root of that problem, it may be different for this client, right? And so we're always open to their unique experience and to the client telling us about themselves. All right, I hope you found those, those tips helpful. If you have anything you wanna add um, or any questions about those, please feel free to leave them in the comments below.